everybody. I'm Marilyn, CEO and founder of Cosmic Centers and the host of this weekly live video series called Center Stage. For those of you who don't know, Center Stage is a weekly video series, and this season is all about the magic of teams. Every Thursday afternoon, 3.30 p.m. UAE time, myself and some incredible guests come here onto LinkedIn Live to share insights, opinions, and perspectives about what makes teams cohesive, high-performing, and happy. And before we begin, I wanted to wish a happy Diwali to all of you who celebrate. I also want to remind you to give this video a like, and of course, please do contribute and leave questions in the comment section. Uh, our team is on the lookout for them, and I'm hoping I can get Sam to answer a few before the end of the episode. So for the second episode of our second season, I'm joined by Sam Yeats, who's the founder of TeamForm. TeamForm is a platform that helps leaders to plan, build, and manage cross-functional teams to improve work outcomes and reduce costs. It enables leaders to make data-driven, informed decisions about their organization. Um, Sam is a driven entrepreneur with over 20 years in technology and business transformation experience. He's a father of three, and as the founder of Team Form, he's been working with high growth startups and large enterprises on a mission to help them create the conditions where their teams can do their best work. And that makes us really happy. Sam, we're so glad to have you here with us today. Hey, yeah, so re really appreciate the time to, to spend with you today and uh, love the first series, um, Teams. Yeah, is uh, at the core of yeah what, what I'm focused on. So really enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Boy, do I have questions for you. Um, so what Sam is referring to is that for those of you who didn't catch our last episode, you know that this season, who did catch it, you know that this season is about the magic of teams. Last week, Connie Hadley, an organizational psychologist, helped us to understand what is a team? You know, we, we call everything team these days, but really teams are very special uh, dynamics and criteria. And we thought it would be great to just start with resetting the base. And today in our second chapter, we're going to focus on how we can leverage data to enable high performing teams with Sam. And this topic reminds me also of a conversation we had last season with Panish Puranam. He's a professor of strategy and the Roland Berger Chair Professor of Strategy and Organizational Design at INSEAD. And last year we spoke about how data can support an organizational design. But today we're going to zoom in and look at how we can leverage and collect data about teams to help improve their dynamics, their performance, and something that's very close to our heart, their levels of happiness. And um, what's really struck me as we were preparing for this episode is that I feel like organizational level data and individual level data around employee metrics, you know, or efficiency or productivity or engagement is more or less widely available in organizations. But it tends to be focused on that group level or individual, but, I, but rarely on the teams themselves. And it, it does feel counterproductive because so much of how organizations function is centered around teams. So the question we want to answer today is how can you drive your teams towards outstanding results when you don't actually measure those components? And we're hoping that Sam can teach us a little bit about how and what metrics can be used to efficiently learn about how to enhance teamwork. And so Sam, I'm going to jump in into our first question. Um, let's start with, I love definitions, so I always start with that. Tell us, in your definition, in your perspective, what is a high-performing team? Yeah, so I think, I think at first, you know, a high-performing team has this unique sense, uh, a differentiated sense of purpose and mission. What are they there to solve for? Like, why are they gathered as this unit? Uh, uh, you know, how they, they actually seek out and try and understand, you know, uh, the work that they're doing, how does it support their customers or how does it uh, help progress the mission of the company? Um, uh, and so, yeah, that's, a, that's quite a unique thing that differenti differentiates them from just uh, other teams. I think also when you look at the people in a team, they feel like a team. You know, on a sports field, uh, you see players that have trained together and worked together. You know, they celebrate the wins and they come together when they lose and uh, they face challenges. And so, uh, yeah, that, that um, yeah, I think that's another, another key, key aspect. And they also have complementary skill sets. So I think high-performing perform, teams are less reliant on other teams. They don't 
start one part of their work, they wait for others, they then continue. They realise that they need to come together with other skill sets uh, uh, in order to deliver value and, and actually uh, really move move fast. Um, and so, yeah, we, we look, you know, I look for traits for, for these teams. You know, are they ambitious? You know, do they want to deliver results? You know, um, uh, are they learning uh, and adapting and pivoting and changing? Um, uh, and yeah, are they really clear always in everything that they're talking about, about what, you know, the work they're doing and how it aligns to the outcome? I think um, there's some of the you know, key, key characteristics. Yeah, I, I mean, I love that piece about having clarity on the purpose and the outcome of their work together. Um, tell us a little bit more about how you see these teams forming that piece of, honestly, what you could call their identity within the broader organization around what it is that they're really here to contribute. Mm. Uh, yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. Um, and so, yeah, there's many ways that teams can actually form, you know, uh, uh, sometimes they're put together, uh, sometimes they're naturally, you know, people literally wheel desks across the room, uh, you know, or, you know, create a, a Slack group or a, a Teams channel. And so knowing that there's different ways that teams can, can come into existence uh, I think a really important part uh, uh, is, yeah, is the team coming together and actually taking the time out to define what is their identity, you know, uh, what is the purpose, writing that down together, challenging each other, pushing each other, stretching and, and, and coming up with that sort of mission statement as a, as a team. Uh, often a team name can be super helpful as well or a logo that, you know, uh, uh, you can put on your confluence page or, you know, uh, T-shirts at certain points. You know, th those types of thing, things really help to, uh, you know, to give that, uh, uh, that you know, to, to take a, a collection of people or a group of people and actually make them a team, you know, uh, you know that are there for, for something, you know, uh, yeah, uh, specific, specific. So, I. Uh, yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, those practices coming together, uh, defining an identity is, is a really important step as, as a team. Yeah, I mean, you and I were chatting a bit about some of the things we, we spoke about last uh, episode with Connie, uh, just before the show. And we were talking about this piece that also what is really important is knowing that you're part of a team so often, and especially in larger organizations, um, we don't even, you know, we observe that people don't even know what team they're on or how they were created. Um, another thing that you mentioned earlier that I want to deep dive into it, and I think maybe this comes a lot with naturally for people who've practiced agile before, but isn't always obvious to others. You mentioned that um, for you, high performing teams are teams that are able to kind of deliver without relying on other teams. Talk to me a little bit about more about that and how do you help organizations think about who needs to be on that team so that they can accomplish things with some level of independence? Mm. Yeah, so yeah, but back on that first first part, you know, one of the, the first questions to ask is if you're a new member to this to an organization, where would you go to see the teams that exist, these cross-functional teams? Uh, you can't go to the, the HR system. Uh, you know, that just shows you who works for who. You know, where do you actually go? Um, uh, uh, yeah, so you're a welcoming place and that people can really understand how to, to interact with each other and be effective in the organisation. Uh, and so, but, but yeah, then, then, you know, I guess once you've got a sense of that network of teams, how do you interact? Um, uh, what are those relationships between teams, um, uh, you know, that are important to... You know, solidify and define uh, so you can be, you know, you can be effective. Yeah. Team Form is a lot about actually high, like the, the software that you've developed is about helping organizations actually make visible the teams that are within them. Um, and a cross-functional team, at least if, you know, if I go back to like, again, definitions as always, um, 
you know, I'll read it out here and would love for you to comment on that, um, is formed of at least three members that belong to different functional entities that are working together to reach a common goal. These members have various functional skills and experience, and they come from different sections within the organization. And I think that's a lot of the teams that kind of you help support and create the right environment for. Um, we tend to say that cross-functional teams have an advantage. You know, there's a lot of research about the importance of not just functional diversity, but all kinds of diversity, whether it's age or gender um, and other types of diversity as well. Um, what are your thoughts about the advantages of cross-functional teams and the value that they can bring? And also, how does this play into, uh, maybe you've observed during the pandemic, how does that evolve during remote times? It's a lot more difficult to identify who knows what, especially if new people have been recruited in the process. How has that creation of cross-functional teams evolved over the last two years? Yeah, so the way I think about it, there's sort of two types, uh, well, uh, yeah, many types of teams, but uh, you've got uh, identified teams, teams that are identified as cross-functional. Uh, you know, uh, they might have that name or... Uh, you know, that, that, that purpose. But you also just have collaborations. Like if you're an organisation that hasn't formally moved into agile cross-functional teams, then your organisation is likely or already is made up of people that are collaborating together, working together across, you know, functional bounds to get things done. And so, yeah, really I think, um, uh, yeah, this movement into cross-functional teams has helped define that unit and also you know it's allowing us to start and I think it's still very early days to actually look at our organizations through that through that lens we talk about you know diversity uh, you know uh, inclusion and uh, you know many of the other uh, perf you know, uh, goals and metrics that exist in organizations at the moment uh, the way leaders look at their organization uh, it's hardwired to who works for who? You know, it's it's not. I, I haven't seen many organisations that have uh, had metrics that uh, you know show us the diversity for the people that are actually working together. It's showing us the diverse. All the metrics coming up to the CEO uh, show us the diversity of the people that are working in a in a single functional structure. And so I think uh, as soon as organisations can understand the value. Uh, uh, that yeah, teams and especially cross-functional teams bring and the value that's delivered, uh, we should really prioritise looking at that uh, and working to improve those, those conditions. We're going to talk about those metrics in a second. I want to ask you one last question about kind of team composition, right? Um, and one of the things that we spoke about last week with Connie and that's always been kind of in the literature, at least the academic part around teams, is this importance of the permanence of membership, right? Like what we see is that um, people who are members of a team for a longer time and teams that are more stable in their membership, and of course we see that in agile methodologies as well, um, tend to become higher performing teams from the connection that they form, the level of mutual knowledge that they develop, like, and their ability to just work really well together. And yet in large enterprises, not just because of reorganizations, which in and of themselves occur all the time, but just the kind of the nature of the constant change in who works with whom and who you're collaborating with, that doesn't tend to be, you know, um, something that we see often in, in those teams. What are your thoughts about that importance of being a member of a team for a long time? Mm. Yeah, no, really, really important topic. Uh, yeah, you've, you've, you've got to appreciate that um, uh, just, again, like a sporting team or any, any other type of team, uh, it takes three to six months, you know, to bond, to define your purpose, to get into a cadence. Uh, and uh, and so, yeah, organisations, I guess, need to be able to see that, uh, be able to me you know, measure that. How long have people been working with each other? Have we actually, you know, have we given them a chance of success? Um, uh, and, yeah, are we actually promoting the use of stable teams uh, but, and only disrupting when we, when we, need, when we need to? Um, and, again, yeah, if we don't even... Uh, yeah, one of those first questions, as you, know, you were talking about before, uh, you know, who are our teams? You know, do the team members even know? Does the organisation know? Uh, uh, yeah, we need to start measuring measuring this so we can be looking at those dynamics um, 
uh, you know, and uh, allowing the teams to get to a point where they can actually deliver great value uh, for the company. Um, uh, and so, yeah, being aware of that uh, and having the patience to, uh, yeah. to be able to see teams through to that stability uh, is really, really critical if you want it to uh, deliver great results. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think we've uh, become very impatient with um, our human capital and their ability to generate value. And we just expect to throw people together and that they can just figure it out instantly. And we forget about the importance of time. You know, we're in such a speedy um, period of, of humanity that we forget that we still need time to form. You know, we haven't, our, our genes haven't evolved as fast as our technology and we still have basic fundamental needs that require a minute. Um, I see here a question from the audience. I'll, I'll read it out to you because it's on this topic. And then I'd love to deep dive into the data that we can, you know, collect around teams. But um, another question on cross-functional teams here is what have you seen are some of the most common challenge that cross-functional teams face and particularly in distributed settings? Mm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it depends on the size of the organization. Um, yeah, one of the one of the common challenges, uh, and it's common in many organizations, small and and large, uh, you know, a, a simple things, well, what should be simple things like funding models, you know, these are people employed by the organization to deliver value. Um, uh, but but how do how do the funding models of the organization actually promote uh, this team based uh, team based environment? Um, Often, you know, uh, you know, some of these organisational, uh, you know, elements uh, can actually be, you know, uh, you know, be the things that that break teams apart. Um, uh, you know, if if you're, you're time sheeting or you're, um, uh, you know, you're, you're booking to certain places or funded by different budgets, a budget can expire here and half a team vanishes overnight. Um, uh, without the organization being conscious of that. And so it is really important to, for leaders, I think, uh, once, uh, once they can see these teams being established um, and teams of teams being established, to think about what is the operating system or the operating model of the organization uh, and how they're going to reconfigure some of these elements um, to promote stable teams and to allow cross-functionality. Um, uh, for, for people to come together. So. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, we've worked with, with quite a few clients, but I'm thinking about one in particular where there is an intention to create a team uh, to deliver on a very specific purpose operationally, let's say, like at, at, at least in terms of the members of the team and the leadership of the team, everything is there for success. But if you look at in order for them to achieve their goals, what budget kind of buckets they need to you know kind of get funding from mm. they have to deal with a procurement process where instead of having a unified budget or a sim i'm going to call it a simplified budget bucket they're actually digging into the budget of 30 other different projects right mm. you can imagine the amount of like just overhead and extra work that they have to do just to manage the financing the procurement like the, the billing process of all of this, they have to essentially pool resources of 30 different places just to be able to accomplish their goal. That's a lot to overcome. And, and just to, to riff off that for a sec. So yeah, using data, this is a great area where organizations can use their data um, uh, to think about how they re reconfigure. Um, uh, you know, by, by, yeah, if you don't have that lens of teams, uh, so, uh, yeah, how could you use that data of the 10 people that are, you know are working together, you know are delivering a common outcome, but if we can use that, those 10 people to identify that they're booking to 20 budgets, they're uh, touching these projects, that data can be you know, um, a great change catalyst uh, to help finance and other functions think about how they could do things differently. Um, and so, yeah, need to think about how do you use that complexity to actually, um, and the data of that complexity to, to drive the change that's going to set these teams up for success. Yeah, absolutely. And I see, uh, 
you know, Rhea and Imran chiming, chiming in here about our conversation. Uh, Rhea's mentioning, actually, uh, Rhea's a friend of mine. We were having a conversation about this last week. So she's mentioning in the comments that just what you said earlier, which is that most companies make that explicit vertical structure really evident for everybody. But sometimes you might be reporting to someone and you never talk to them, right? Like mm -hmm. it does right. happen. It's not unheard of. And um, how important it is to just take that, that cube and kind of look at it through a different dimension. Mm. Uh, and Imran he, here is mentioning that um, he thinks that as a company, one should create core habits that transcend across projects work and create sets of behavior that work in cross-functional teams. So a lot of echoing, you know, um, of this idea that we're looking at organization through a lens that just is not, is less re less and less relevant the more we collaborate across functions. So mm. now let's deep dive into the topic of data. You know, we, we know that it's important to measure it and it's important to action it. Otherwise, you know, we're drowned by data all day long. But what are the basic data points or metrics that you think one should collect around teams in order to both be able to identify them, but also think through their performance, their growth and their ability to deliver? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I guess there's there's a, a number of different ways to 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 look at this. Um, uh, for some of the you know indicators of you know like leadership, collaboration, trust levels, um, yeah, there's some great resources available. Things like the you know Atlassian um, Team Health Check uh, and a whole range of other you know um, tools um, uh, that that just create those great conversations within the team uh, to, to understand where people are at uh, and to, and to self-improve. Um, but, yeah, th there's also, I guess, other metrics that come through in the work and in the data. And so some of those, uh, as an example, are measuring cycle time. Now, uh, cycle time is an interesting metric. Some people think, you know, cycle time could be like many, you know, there's many definitions of what cycle time is and, and agreeing what, what this is for your team is, is quite a valuable exercise. You know, is it from when a ticket goes from, you know, uh, the backlog to, uh, you know, when it moves from in progress to done, or is it from when you receive feedback from a customer of something you shipped, uh, it's been prioritized in the backlog and it's reached, you know, re reached the customer. Uh, I've seen you know, many, many organizations get caught. They, they think done is shipping into a testing environment, but it could take three or three or six months to get into production, into the hands of customers. And if, if the team isn't feeling that and they're, uh, they're sort of uh, devoting themselves of responsibility to, to see that work through, um, it can be really, really dangerous. So, so getting into the nitty gritty of some of these metrics, so cycle time is a good one. Frequency of change. How quickly can we move as a team? Uh, do you know? Have we um, uh, have we streamlined as much as we can? Um, have we automated things if we're a tech team? Uh, you know, th these types of metrics can be super super helpful. And another one is just saying, and because uh, yeah, you need to keep some of this as simple as possible. Uh, there's a million ways you can me measure it, and there is massive survey fatigue, um, especially as we've you know, all sw switched to um, to remote and, and uh, being bombarded by things. Um, but yeah, what would I need to do to recommend this team to a friend? So yeah, how would I would I recommend the team I'm in? And I need to I need to also work with the team to improve. What would I do? What would I What would I personally change? What do we as a team need to change for me to be at a place that I could recommend it to my um, to my peers or colleagues? Um, and so, I think simplifying some of these metrics are really important, um, uh, but also having some stability so you can look at uh, look at these things over time um, is also very valuable for a team. I have so many questions for you about this stuff. So you mentioned the Atlassian um, health check. I know there's more than one. I, I just opened here the, the project team one because the, obviously leadership teams and project teams and so on, they have slightly different uh, natures. As you mentioned earlier, there are different kinds of team. And I think it's really interesting. We, I'll, I'll quickly walk us through what are the categories, let's say, of, of data points that they look at. They look at the availability of a full-time owner that's dedicated 80% of their time to this. They look at how balanced the team in terms of the roles and responsibilities mm. and that everybody understands, but also that there are the right 
skill sets, which is what you were talking about earlier, the shared understanding about this common goal, um, your ability to have metrics in helping you measure the value that you're creating, whether you've created a proof of concept for your work, whether you're able to explain it simply, and whether you've managed the dependencies um, with other teams when necessary, if complexity is, um, has to be introduced, and what you were talking about, which is velocity now. Um, and I think, talk to me about also, so measuring these things is important. How, how does the team talk about them? And then how does leadership look at this data? Mm. Yeah. Really, really important to think about those those things things separately as well. Um, so, yeah, as a, as a team, having that practice, and as, as I said before, a high-performing team, core to them, they want to improve. It's just in their, um, uh, yeah, it's in their nature to want to, uh, to want to improve and want to ask these questions of themselves. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think the, the great thing about some of those questions in the playbook is... Um, like do this, the most simple question, do you have a product owner? Is there someone in the team that is leading and providing direction to the team? It's, it's amazing how many times that is not clear. Um, uh, and it's really the first step for a team to sort of step out or, or maybe the team's got two, two people that think that they're leading the team and they, they, they need to actually clarify that and work, work that through. And so asking that question in a room uh, or you know, a virtual room, uh, and seeing the reactions of each of the team members. Um, some people think there is a product owner. Some people think there isn't, and they're all in the same room. can be a really healthy, can be confronting, but a really healthy um, healthy discussion. Uh, I think, yeah, one of the, yeah, there, 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 there needs to be very careful thought of how some of these team level metrics are operationalized in a, you know, in a team of teams or a you know um, a whole of company uh, setting, some of these these metrics, uh, if measured in the wrong way, can result in some really poor um, really poor behaviour and people gaming um, gaming the system. And so um, yeah, we've seen instances where some of these metrics have been become KPIs uh, for leaders, uh, and uh, you know all of a sudden you've got um, you know uh, you've got you know, things happening that, that, you know, are to game the metrics. Um, and so there needs to be very careful thought on, yeah, uh, on why are we measuring it? Uh, why are we doing that? Um, uh, you know, and, and you know, I really think the, the, the focus of leadership should be fo focused on what are our outcomes and our goals? Are we tracking, you know, to achieve those goals? And, and maybe some separation between those team level um, those team level metrics. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's always a big debate with me, like no matter what the size of the organization, KPI setting is like, we could, we should probably spend a whole other episode talking mm -hmm. about that. But as soon as you, um, you create these kind of KPIs that don't measure real value creation, because it's great to have a great team, but in the end, if this great team isn't accomplishing the goal, then actually, is it as great as that that data point says probably not right and i think definitely turning these into kpis is a completely bad idea like i'll, I'll share a personal example um so um i signed up to this tool for the for just to test it i was curious um uh, which kind of looks at um team health um more from the point of view i'm going to say of like culture and are people happy at work so not so much about the team itself but let's say about the engagement of the employees within the team um it's called office vibe it's, it's not bad at all i mean i i like the experience it's fun and then at first i didn't uh, I, I i signed up almost by mistake it has a really smart feature it has a slack connect and so actually when my team started growing i didn't even realize that office vibe was sending emails to my team members and one day i suddenly got like a, a grade you know a, this is how much you score. And I was like, wait, what is this? So I went in and I explored it. And there is definitely a danger. And I and and I immediately caught myself, you know, sometimes, especially if you are really passionate about building the best environment possible, you become obsessive about making sure that you're doing everything right. And then we had a grade and it was a nine over 10. And I was like, why isn't it a 10? And I was like, Marilyn, like <laughs> you need to chill. First of all, it's awesome. Second of all, it's not about the grade, right? Like 
And instead, I think I tried to approach it in a healthier way, which was I said to the team, great, let's have a retrospective. You know, let's talk about the things that we feel are taking this grade up and the things that are taking it down, but we're not going to obsess about the number. It, that's not the point, right? Um, what we are going to obsess about is continuously improving our collaboration and, and how we work together and fixing things that don't work and so on. Um, but I like just from a personal point of view, you can fall into that trap. And here I'm the leader of the organization, so I could quickly self-correct, but I can only imagine in an environment where this becomes a KPI for everybody, what the, what the outcome would be. And you'd probably spend a lot of sweat on things that maybe matter less to the real business outcomes. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. And yeah, I, th I think that there's a, there's a great place for, uh, you know, rather than just, just measuring um, uh, numerically, th you know, items, you know how, how do you actually surface the systemic blockers, especially in larger organizations? Uh, how, yeah, how do you how do you bubble up the verbatims, uh, uh, you know, of the blockers that if leaders took action could help teams move move faster? And so, finding that balance and being very careful about what's incentivized, um, uh, I think is the right way forward. Yeah, absolutely. Talk to me. Do you think that there are different kind of um, like we said, like? metrics to health check teams at different times of their life cycle like you know we all talk about the forming storming norming performing and even the death of teams like teams also sometimes just come to an end because they've accomplished mm -hmm. their mission um are there specific data points or you know metrics that you think it's important to look at during those different phases is it different in the beginning than it is in the end mm. i yeah, no, it's a it, yeah, good good question. Um, uh, yeah, one one of the things you know, and, and it came through on that that health uh, the health check you mentioned before. Have we delivered a proof of concept? That time from yeah, yes, it takes time for a team to form and norm and uh, you know start delivering value. I think it is a really important thing for a team to have that sense of. Uh, have we shipped something or not? <laughs> and knowing that from day one in the team, because you can break some really big problems down uh, and ship in the first week or two of a team. Um, uh, but some teams, you know, it could take a year before value is delivered. And so, uh, yeah, I guess thinking retrospectively um, in leading large, you know, um, you know, teams of teams in the past, one of the things that I, you know, have reflected on is, you know, if we, if we were um, measuring from day one um, uh, and asking ourselves, have we, you know, what value have we delivered? What is our cycle time from very early in the cycle of a team being established? Uh, you know, could we have actually brought forward results, you know, um, and also broken things down. The longer the longer you take to start to look at these things of deployment frequencies of cycle times, uh, the more ingrained the practices could be to overinflate, you know, uh, each component that you ship or each um, deliverable, rather than thinking about how can we move, um, you know, how can we chip away at this problem uh, rather than the big bang, and so. Um, so I think there is a, uh, a place for some stable, these stable, um, uh, stable metrics. Um, uh, but but yeah, there, there's certainly a whole bunch of other practices um, uh, that are, are really important in the early forming of a team um, uh, that we you know, we've talked about just before. Yeah, and someone here is asking, and I think it's a it's a worthy question. I mean, I think that. For you know, your metric around cycle time and what you call deployment, I think these are applicable. I mean, you want to call them delivery, you want to call them anything. Deployment tends to be mm. a bit like more focused on the software side of the world, well, I guess. Yeah. But um, a question from the audience that I think would be interesting to, to look at is, um, are these metrics we're talking about actually specific to development or R&D? Or do you think that they can be used across industries? Yeah, so I think, yeah, it's it's... It's interesting. Yeah, a lot of um, yes, cycle time you can apply to um, you know really you know any 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 activity. But once you've identified what value is, um, and if you've got a repetitive you know 
uh, ac activity, me being able to measure that um, and to be able to agree on the size that you're breaking down the work um, as a team and seeing that move through, um, you know, is, is, yeah, is really, really valuable. But yes, there are different metrics for different types of teams. Um, uh, you know, I guess the, some of the software um, metrics have been more, you know, measurable and um, cross-functional teams, you know, there's a, a strong sort of genesis in, in that in that area. Um, but, you know, we're obviously seeing cross-functional teams in all departments, in all parts of businesses these days. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely think that these metrics can run across. For sure, with software development, it's easier because um, even measuring how, you know, if you, if you practice Scrum or something like that, then you can measure down to the task, you can measure the velocity, like it's easier to measure, but I don't think that um, you, you can't implement them in other industries, but perhaps the way you measure them differs from one place to the next. Mm. Um, I think, you know, I want to kind of also lead us into the roles of leadership. You know, uh, last week I asked Connie if a team needed a leader or not. And I think we kind of all generally agree that teams need leadership. It doesn't necessarily mean they have to be everybody's boss or that they get to decide on everybody's pay raise, but leadership in terms of like keeping that engine running and making that purpose clear and realigning everybody is important. How do you think that leaders can create the right conditions for teams to really perform? I know we talked about funding models earlier, but are there any other things that leaders mm. need to make available for teams so that they can do their best work? Yeah, no, good, good question. Uh, it, I think, yeah, one of the things that we've seen with this shift to remote work is, you know, we're all consuming a lot more uh, and we're, you know, we're, we're consuming asynchronous sort of communication um, uh, uh, and we're working a lot more with the people that are close to us. Um, and so having people that are looking up and out, uh, interacting with other parts of the organisation, um, we should all be curious and we should all want to uh, get out and do that. But that's really suffered in this, um, uh, in this remote working shift. And so I think one of the key aspects of it, you know, as a, of a leader is to um, is to be able to look up and out um, more actively. Um, you know, primary role of looking after the team, keeping the team, uh, you know, uh, focused on the on uh, the outcome, removing blockers, uh, but being able to look up and out and across the organisation, uh, I think is going to is a really you know uh, being curious making networks, you know, making connections, um, you know, is, is a really important aspect um, uh, for leadership in this next phase, especially in, you know, in a remote remote setting. There's a great risk that, you know, organisations suffer in innovation uh, because we're not having those uh, water cooler or elevator uh, discussions. And so um, I think more than others, leaders, um, uh, be, need to need to sort of over index on some of um, some of that that cross company collaboration, but yeah, for for yeah, I guess key key um, in, in in the leadership is to get out of the way. You know, uh, as the team lead, uh, you know, you want to remove every possible blocker um, that the team uh, has and do that as quickly and effectively as possible um, uh, to keep them focused. You know. Uh, on delivering, you know, on delivering value, and you know, often, especially in larger organisations, there's periods of uncertainty. Uh, you know, are we going to get this funding? Are we um, going to move to that priority? Uh, and so, working with the team, inspiring the team, uh, you know, managing back up and helping the organisation work out what's next for this team that's built. You know, uh, this. Um, uh, you know, this practice together, uh, camaraderie together and can can deliver value. You know, uh, I think there's a real responsibility on leaders to, um, you know, to, to manage, you know, uh, you know to ma manage through that as well. Yeah, I love that. I mean, you're making me think back about um, one of my first jobs where I was actually managing teams across three different continents. And I used to joke that actually... I didn't have any job outside of, uh, I used to picture myself like one of the old school, like telephone operators that would just like plug a cable into this and that and just help people right, the connection. Uh, reach yeah. each other, right? And and that idea of actually if get out of their way, give them resources and help and support when they need it. But as you say, like look up and out and make sure that 
the conversations with the other parts of the organizations are happening, that information is flowing is, is such an important piece of that leadership role. And, and, and that change management, I think that's particularly true in really large organizations. Like, of course, startups move really fast, but startups have a sense of stability of like membership and purpose that big companies find it harder to deliver across the organization and so you end up as a leader having to create that space for your own team i think that's really great advice and even one of the teams that hired us like the kind of banner under which we did our work to support them to kind of keep that cohesion going was becoming masters of change because to your point so much happens in large organizations so much is changing around them it's easy to get caught up in the storm and mm -hmm. i used to have a professor yeah. who who said something about being a good leader that i really love which is that the job of the leader is to diminish the perception of uncertainty for their team so that their mm -hmm. team can do their best work right like you take on all of the external noise and vibes and waves that are coming and you create a space of kind of more certainty and more stability and then you let your team do their best work and i think that's kind of what you were hinting at with that idea of like get out give them what they need get out of the way create the right space and just let that team do the work i think that's really powerful um advice actually thank you so much for that um and with that, uh, we're going to come to our rapid fire questions. I can't believe we're almost at the end of this episode. I've really enjoyed it and I think learned a lot. And it's, it's really such a salient point for me that although teams make up, you know, most of the organisms inside an organization, we don't actually look at them as such, right? We, mm -hmm. we look at individuals and we look at hierarchies, but the true kind of beating organisms of companies are teams and it, it needs to become a much bigger priority. And, uh, and I think the work that you're doing with Team Form really supports that. So, you know, I'm very excited to see what's in the future. Um, and now I have five rapid fire questions for you, Sam. Are you ready? Okay, hit me. All right. What is the one thing that every team needs? Goal. A goal. What is the one thing that every team needs to avoid? Waiting. <laughs> yes, I love that. Uh, what is a good team leader? Uh, they unblock. Someone who blocks? Unblocks. Unblocks. Beautiful. Someone who's able to get the hurdles out of the way. Um, yeah. What is the best book on teams? Yeah. So uh, Team Topologies is my current favorite book on teams, really taking this to the next level. Oh, brilliant. I haven't I haven't come across that one. I'm going to add it to my library. Yeah, yeah. And then last but not least, what's your favorite team ritual? Yeah, so we, we've done this thing as a team uh, since the start of the pandemic. Uh, so every day at Stand Up, we have a question of the day. So mm -hmm. every team member, it takes 10 seconds uh, per person. But literally every day for 18 months, um, uh, the Scrum, Scrum Master of the Week, um, uh, asks, you know, a question, what's your favorite color? You know, what's, uh, if you had a time machine, where would you go? Uh, and, um, yeah, may maybe I'll post a list of some of the questions, yeah. uh, but we've just found that a great sort of ritual as a, as a team, oh, especially in this time. Yeah. I'm going to do a bit of a shameless plug here, but we're actually in the process of printing uh, a card game that we developed that's called Cosmic Conversations. Okay. Uh, and we provide actually um, 52 cards, 104 questions that teams can use uh, in just, just how you said in their daily stand up to kind of just start off with something other than here's what I worked on yesterday. Uh, I really, really believe in that ritual. So um, Cosmic Conversations coming your way, people. Stay tuned. Uh, I'll send oh, you a copy perfect. too, Sam. That'd be great. And, um, yeah, absolutely. Before we close the session, I really want to thank you for being such a great guest. And I know it's really late for you in Australia, so I'm extra grateful for the time you took to join us. Uh, thanks so much for the insights that you shared. And, and thanks for all of our attendees and their great questions and remarks. We didn't get to all of them, but maybe Sam will find you in the comments and answer some of your questions in writing. Of course, as always, we'll, this video is available forever, so you can share the link with anybody and they'll be able to rewatch it. And later on, we'll post it on YouTube and on our website. Um, if you don't do so already, please do follow Cosmic Centaurs. The team puts in so much work producing 
center stage, but also a lot of content throughout the week. And I'm sure it'll make them really happy to see our follower account go up on Instagram, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, or even subscribe to our newsletter if you want to definitely stay up with our new, keeping up with our news, right? Um, I look forward to speaking to all of you in our next episode, same time next week, Thursday, 3.30 p.m., UAE time. We'll be speaking to Sylvia Burberry, who's a regional president of Emerging and Seeds at Royal Canaan. And she'll talk to us about managing global distributed teams. So be sure to tune in next Thursday, November 11th. And on this note, Sam, I really want to thank you for taking the time to be here with us. Um, and uh, any any famous last words? No. Thank, <laughs> thanks so much. And great, great work promoting teams. Yes, thank you. I think you and I share that passion. Well, on that note, I'm signing us off. See you all next week.